Alphonse, put it on vibrate and put it someplace good. <laughs> I'll tell you the funny story about this. Deb talked about since 1983. I've been doing about 100 talks a year. 1983, in September, I gave my first talk about laughter at this very library. Oh, right here. And it was thanks to Maria Poirier, who was then in charge of programming. And she called me up, and actually this is a very good story. It should be inspiring to people. She called me up and she asked me, we're running a series on healing. We have somebody on Tai Chi, someone on massage therapy. We know you're doing stand-up comedy at what was then the Cassis Place, down on Whitney Avenue, remember on the 10th? And I was also doing therapy, and I also was a teacher. So she figured maybe I could know something, and would I be willing to come and speak about how therapeutic laughter was? And I said, sure. Well, I had just gotten married in May, and my husband really had no idea how crazy I really was. And he was a school principal, kind of conservative, easygoing, warm, loving person. And when he came home, I said, honey, I'm going to be speaking at the Cheshire Library. I, really, he said, what are you speaking about? I said, I'm going to be speaking on the therapeutic value of laughter. He said, well, honey, that's wonderful. What do you know about it? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, nothing. But I know it's true, and I know how to read it. And I gave that first talk, and they, as you know, sent out the calendar for the Cheshire Library all over the place. It got covered by the New Haven Register, the Hartford Current, and the Waterbury Republican, and I started getting phone calls the next day. Right? And I will tell you, this has been the most thrilling ride. When Deb called me up and said, you know, I don't know whether you're still speaking. I said, well, I am still speaking. Well, would you be willing to come and speak at the Cheshire Library? I said, honey, you could ask me to come out of a cake naked <laughs> at the Cheshire, which, by the way, would not be funny. <laughs> Just, just so you know, there was nothing that the Cheshire Library could possibly ask me to do that I would not do. I lived in Cheshire for 31 years. It really is my favorite town in the entire state of Connecticut. And this from a Brooklyn girl. <laughs> Tonight's topic, as you know, is a humorous look at sex and aging. And I can only tell you that if we didn't have a very humorous introduction, the emails that I got knowing that I was doing this talk are priceless. I did this talk at a, seat, a um, community center in Orange, and I got a note from my, from my gynecologist, who is also a friend of mine, and she knows me, as we would say, intimately. <laughs> and she writes to me, Hi, Joyce. You gave a really funny talk tonight, and the audience was so appreciative. Aaron enjoyed it as well, but misunderstood me when I asked him to join me, as he thought the topic was Sex and Asians. <laughs> you cannot make up this stuff. People ask me, where do you get material? I get material just living, just living. So I then had an email today from a man who happens to be a good friend of mine and a minister who lives in Stratford. And he says, he writes to me, it is my pleasure, oh, no, this, actually this is from a videographer who is doing a video to perhaps we'll get on YouTube today, Cheshire Library of all places. And he wrote to me, it is my pleasure to spread the word about old people having good sex. <laughs> but the one that I got from a minister, I am sure you will appreciate, okay? He, he's labeled in the subject, you know, on an email, the subject that said complaint department. <laughs> so I figured I'm in for something good now, right? And he writes, reservations for a free event at a library who ever heard of such a thing? Oh, it is because Joyce is talking dirty again. <laughs> She'll probably say things like sex, penis, and vagina. As if older folks don't have dirty minds too, she'll probably suggest folks have sex with the lights on. Positively the worst thing about electricity. <laughs> Maybe make out in your car. She must think we go to yoga. Or some radical new technique, stimulation technique like Change sides in the bed and pretend you're happy. <laughs> I, for one, am glad that there is no room for me. All that talk, it could make me go blind. <laughs> I really just got this this afternoon. I got home from two events this morning, and I got this this afternoon, and I said, this is too perfect. Now, I will tell you that I usually try to start off with a good joke. And I will tell you my all-time favorite joke 
which when I was speaking in uh, San Diego two years ago for the AATH, that association that gave me the Lifetime Achievement Award, I got up and the people had all known my husband and that he had had a stroke. And I got up and I said, because I'm a very shy and <laughs> quiet person, I got up and I started by saying, I want you to know that I have not had an orgasm in a year and a half. <laughs> so some of the people laughed, some of the people said, yeah, me neither, but... <laughs> I said, the only time I now have an orgasm is when someone tells me a joke I have never heard before. So everybody at the conference, all four days, were trying to tell me new jokes. <laughs> in the hope of you know, making it a really stimulating conference. <laughs> but the best joke I am going to tell to you. A man, and it's a perfect place to have this joke in the library. A man takes his dog to the movie theater, sits the dog in one chair, he sits in the chair next to it. Every time there's a sad scene in the movie, the dog is crying his eyes out. And every time there's a funny scene in the movie, the dog is laughing his ass off. And at the end of the movie, the man is exiting the theater with his dog, and as he's walking up the aisle, the manager comes running down the aisle and says, wait, don't go, I have to talk to you. I have been watching your dog. This dog is unbelievable. This dog understood every nuance of every emotional state in this entire movie. I am amazed. And the dog owner looks at him and says, you're amazed. I'm even more amazed. He hated the book. <laughs> I love talking about this because, among other things, I think as long as we are alive, we are excited by other people. And not just sexually, we are excited. It is wonderful to be with people, and by the way, I do talks about longevity, I do talks about laughter, I do talks about resilience, all of the topics you can think of. And every one of the research studies that I have read all come up with the same three things that keep people living longer, healthier lives, and happier. The same three things, not always in the same order, but I'm going to tell you these three things because they have bearing on what we're going to be talking about. The first thing is socialization. Anybody who thinks that it is good to be alone in your house with one aid is making a big mistake because in places like Elam Park and other places where there's a community, there are people to eat with, people to laugh with, people to go to meetings with, that makes all the difference. So that's number one is socialization. Number three is laughter and a positive attitude. That no matter where you go, you can bring a positive attitude with you. And by the way, my button, which says up, says undercover positivity, which is one of my friends, AATH, um, her, she's a, a, originally a school psychologist. My friend Connie Pino is doing this for her project. And she said that when we're waiting on a line, when you see somebody who's looking a little down, just send them some positive energy. You don't have to talk to them. Just send them some positive energy, and you will see very often the person will perk right up. Well, all of, you know, we're in an energy field. That's what the universe is made up of, energy field. So if we can put more uh, positive in the energy into the atmosphere, why would we not do that? So just think about it. That's up. And by the way, uh, one of our friends said that he has one called poo, which is positive something. <laughs> uh, I like that a lot. So the second thing, which is what I did not tell you yet from the three things, is helping other people. All right. So whatever you do to help somebody else, whether it's to help somebody eat, whether it's to call somebody who hasn't had a call in a while, whatever it is that you do that helps other people is going to help you live longer, healthier, happier lives. And I believe that the one thing that God gave me as a skill, because it wasn't keeping thin, it wasn't keeping my mouth shut, it wasn't uh, making good food, I'm not a good cook, I serve great ice cream, though. <laughs> Every my neighborhood come over, I always have five flavors in the freezer. But the one thing that I was given as a skill was to be able to teach and make people feel better, to laugh. So any joke that you can tell somebody, and I do recommend sincerely that you keep next to your telephones, because I'm looking at in this group, I don't see anybody under 20 except for maybe one or two people. <laughs> so most of us have children or grandchildren. When they call you up and they say, Grandma, Grandpa, how are you? Don't tell them. <laughs> All right? It is just leaves you feeling sad and depressed to have somebody tell you they just had a colonoscopy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right is, it's hard for me to move. 
I can't straighten up for 20 minutes in the morning. And they can't do anything with that. So as a result, they call you because they have to. But it's not a pleasurable experience. My suggestion is keep some jokes right next to your telephone. And when your kids or grandkids call you up and say, how are you? You say, fine, right? And say, would you like to hear a new joke? And I guarantee you, when they hang up, not only will they laugh because they hear a joke, but they're going to tell all their friends, you're not going to believe the joke my grandmother told me. <laughs> right? So think about it. Think about changing a couple of the ways that you see other people to help them laugh with lecture. And now we're going to get to the nitty gritty here. We are talking about a humorous look at sex and Asians. <laughs> and I'm going to give you 10 pointers which are actual facts. You know, I always feel that since I'm a university professor, people expect that they should learn something. And when I did stand-up comedy briefly in between husbands, I did, <laughs> I, I was invited back to Good Times in New York, I was invited back to Danger Fields, and I never went back. Because doing stand-up comedy is missing what teaching has. Teaching has that added dimension of feeling like somebody will do something differently because of something they said. So I am going to give you the research, and then I will plug in, of course, some humorous things so that you can be laughing about it, all right? And just so you know that old people are supposed to be talking about sex, I got an AARP magazine, and I mostly don't get a chance to read it. This time I opened it up, and here is the ad, okay? And the ad says, don't miss out on the best sex of your life. And then it says, see for yourself on discreet home video. You understand this in AAOP magazine. <laughs> <laughs> this was not in Hustler, it was not in okay? And there are ten videos, ten, mind you, this is what it says. Ten educational videos, two hundred dollar value, only $29.90 for shipping. <laughs> Sounds like a buy to me, right? And of course they give you, of course, some of the topics that are on here, and you would like to know. Topic number one. I mean, they're not wasting any time in this series. Topic number one, the art of oral loving. I figure that's talking about it. <laughs> I love you madly. Does it, doesn't that work? <laughs> All right, well, from psychology today, the research says, the instant a woman enters a secure relationship, her sex drive begins to plummet. I love that. I just absolutely love that. So you can know if you're really going with somebody seriously, you're engaged to somebody, or God forbid, married to somebody, your sex drive is a thing of the past, okay? It says, a German study found that fewer than half of the women wanted regular sex. Doesn't talk about irregular sex. This is from the article. And after 20 years, only 20% wanted sex regularly. I mean, that is really amazing. After 20 years, it's uh, amazing to me. Now, I'm sure you all know why women love Chinese food. Because one time is not now backwards. <laughs> well, maybe you know about the husband who comes to bed with his wife and he hands us some Advil. And she says, why are you giving me Advil? He says, well, that's for your headache. She says, I don't have a headache. Good, he said, let's do it. <laughs> well, maybe you know this one. This is a medical warning regarding loss of appetite. A woman asks her husband, would you like maybe some bagels and lox, a piece of herring and maybe some grapefruit and tea? He declines. Thanks for asking, honey, but I'm not hungry right now. It's this Viagra, he says. It's really taken the edge off my appetite. <laughs> At lunchtime, she asked him if he would like something like a bowl of soup and a sandwich. He declines again. The Viagra, he says, really trashes my desire for food. Come dinner time, she asks if he wants anything to eat. Would you like a juicy steak and some <laughs> scrumptious cooker or maybe some chicken? He declines again. No, he says. It's got to be the Viagra. I'm still not hungry. Well, she says, would you mind letting me up? I'm starving. <laughs> okay. Here is 
a fact number two. Fact number two is size is not as important as angle, according to the Journal of Urology. They said the average penis size is 5.08 inches. Now, I did not know this, but I have not surveyed that, I have to say. Now, you know why women are traditionally so bad in math? Because all these years, guys have been trying to convince us that this was eight inches. <laughs> When I was born, I was given a choice, a big penis or a good memory. I don't remember what I chose. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps you know about the man who was in a terrible accident and his manhood was mangled and torn from his body. His doctor assured him that modern medicine could give him back his manhood, but that his insurance wouldn't cover the surgery since it was considered to be cosmetic. The doctor said the cost would be $3,500 for small, $6,500 for medium, and $14,000 for large. The man was sure he would want a medium or large, but the doctor urged him to talk it over with his wife before he made any decisions. The man called his wife on the phone and explained their options. The doctor came back into the room and found the man looking truly dejected. Well, what have you two decided, asked the doctor. She said she'd rather get grinded for the kitchen. <laughs> Bill and Sam, two elderly friends, met in the park every day to feed the pigeons, watch the squirrels, and discuss world problems. One day, Bill did not show up. Sam didn't think much about it. I figured he had a cold or something. But after Bill hadn't shown up for a week or so, Sam got worried, but they never took each other's phone numbers because they met every day in the park. A month had passed, and Sam figured he had seen the last of Bill. But one day, Sam approached the park, and lo and behold, there sat Bill, and he was so excited and happy to see him, and told him so. Then he said, for crying out loud, Bill, what in the world happened to you? Bill replied, I've been in jail. Jail, cried Sam. What in the world for? Well, Bill said, you know, Sue, that cute little blonde waitress at the coffee shop where we go sometime? <coughs> yes, yeah, said Sam, I remember her. What about her? Well, one day she filed rape charges against me. At 80 years old, I was so pleased. When I got to court, I pled guilty. <laughs> <laughs> the damn judge gave me 30 days for perjury. <laughs> Fact number three. Fact number three is HIV is rarely spread through heterosexual activity. Only one in five million will get HIV in non-protected sex with a non-drug user. And this is according to the Journal of the American Medical Association. So the fact of the matter is, if the only reason you are not running around making out, it should not be this reason. Okay? <laughs> now having said that, I will tell you one of my all-time favorite stories. <coughs> Ethel checked into a motel on her 65th birthday. She was lonely, a little depressed at her advancing age, so decided to risk an adventure. She thought, I'll call one of those men you see advertised in the phone book for escorts and sensual massages. She looked through the phone book, found a full-page ad for a guy calling himself Tender Tony, a very handsome man with assorted physical skills flexing in the photo. He had all the right muscles in all the right places, thick wavy hair, long powerful legs, dazzling smile, six pack abs, and she felt quite certain she would bounce a dime off his well-oiled buns. <laughs> she figured, what the heck, nobody will ever know. I'll give him a call. Good evening, ma'am. How may I help you? Oh my, he sounded so sexy. Afraid she would lose her nerve if she hesitated, so she rushed right in. I hear you give a great massage. I'd like you to come to my motel room and give me one. No, wait, I should be straight with you. I'm in town all alone, and what I really want is sex. I want it hot, and I want it now. Bring implements, 
toys, everything you've got in your bag of tricks. We'll go at it all night. Tie me up. Cover me in chocolate syrup and whipped cream. Anything and everything. I'm ready. Now, how does that sound? He said, that sounds absolutely fantastic, but you need to press nine for an outside line. <laughs> Edged his way to where the lovely young lady was seated 
His eyes met hers, and at that moment, he designed the possibility of cocktails at a fancy hotel. Suddenly, his sparse gray hair grew fuller, and his liver spots graciously took refuge. The lovely young woman, who he now believed he had a shot with, offered him her seat. For us females, keep this in mind. Madonna was 55 when her boyfriend was 22. Tina Turner was 75 when her boyfriend was 40. J-Lo was 42 when her husband was 26. If you're still single, relax. Your boyfriend is not born yet. <laughs> Maybe you heard about the man sitting on the park bench and crying. And another man comes over and says to him, Sir, can I help you? What's the matter? He said, oh, he said, I just married the most wonderful girl. She's only 45 years old, and she's so beautiful, and she's such a fabulous cook. And again, the visitor says, well, that's wonderful. So why are you crying? Well, when I get home at night, she gives me a full body massage, and it's so wonderful, you wouldn't believe how fabulous it is. And again, the visitor says to him, well, that's wonderful. Why are you crying? He says, well, not only that, she makes love to me all night long. I can hardly get up in the morning because it's so exciting. And he said, well, that's fabulous. Why are you crying? He says, I can't remember where I live. <laughs> now, I, I'm not, I don't know whether you are aware of this, but there's a wonderful story about a young girl who goes to visit her grandmother after grandpa died. And she's offering her condolences, and she says, Grandma, I'm so sorry that Grandpa died. And I was wondering, how did he die? She said, well, honey, she said, truthfully, he died of a heart attack Sunday when we were making love. She says, you were making love. Grandpa was 98 years old. You're 95 years old. What do you mean? No wonder he had a heart attack when you were making love at 98. Well, sweetheart, you don't understand. We always made love every Sunday morning. We found out that the rhythm of the church bells were exactly <laughs> So we would be in on the ding, out on the ding, in on the ding, out on the dime. And he'd be alive today if it weren't for that damn ice cream truck. <laughs> favorite facts. I, they said, older folks are less interested in perfect bodies. An Ohio novelist said, quote, I used to want to touch all parts of a woman's body, but now I want to touch her very soul. To be sexy now, a woman has to have more depth. Ann Landers asked her female readers in 1985 survey, would you be content to be held close and treated tenderly and forget about the act. 90,000 readers responded. That was astounding right there. 90,000 people answered a survey in the newspaper in an Ann Landers column. 72% said yes, and 40% of those people who said yes, they'd rather be held and treated tenderly than to make love in what we think of as sexual intercourse was amazing. 40% of those people who responded that way were under 40, so they were young. On the other hand, one 80-year-old woman replied, this is how it is for me. I've become a vegetarian. But every once in a while, I want red meat. <laughs> I go out and get it and enjoy it. <laughs> now, my answer to this perfect body thing, which has left a long time ago, if I ever had a perfect body, is I have a very wonderful vanity in the shower. I have a beautiful bathroom in Florida, and there's a vanity. And in the vanity, I keep a plastic, one of those plastic bins. And in the bin, I have rolled up underpants and bras. So that when I get out of the shower, I dry myself and I get into an underpants and a bra. Because this builder, on the way from the bathroom to the master bedroom, you walk past the closets. And the closet doors are floor to ceiling mirrors. And if I had to walk past those doors <laughs> naked, I would be too depressed to possibly be talking about laughter in any kind of way. Jerry Seinfeld said, there's very little advice in men's magazines because men think, I know what I'm doing, just show me somebody naked. 
<laughs> right? And this one is from Robert De Niro, and I love this one. According to a new survey, women say they feel more comfortable undressing in front of men than they do undressing in front of other women. They say that women are too judgmental, where, of course, men are just grateful. <laughs> one of my favorite, um, really one of my favorite quotes, because as newly widowed over the last little more than a year, I actually have a shirt that I wrote on the pocket, Born Again Virgin, <laughs> which must be what happens to one after enough time, you know. This is according to Gail Sheen. How many of you remember Passages? Many of us were like in our 30s when Passages kind of... Gail Sheen wrote a new book, and I got to sit at the table with her because we were both speaking at the same conference. Her new book is New Passages. And she talks about, for a single woman, there is something she refers to as the pilot light lover. Now, you all remember pilot lights from when we were growing up? Right? You had to get that out in order to get to Yes, sir, of course. Well, the pilot light lover is the person who reignites a woman's capacity for love and sex. You remember what it feels like to be excited kind of like those teenage years when you were just turned on by ridiculous kinds of things. And it's kind of like a candy jar filled with interesting men who become lovers or friends. Someday I will come back and give you the talk that I'm presently writing, being in a single seat again. And I knew that it was worth joining one of the websites. I knew it when I got the very first message from somebody. I figured it was going to give me material. The first person wrote that he was very athletic and intelligent and misspelled intelligent. <laughs> so I knew I was on the right track. <laughs> now, given that I lived in Cheshire for so long, I will tell you that when I was living in Cheshire and I had gotten divorced, we used to have a gas station right on Route 10 before you got to the shopping center. And there was a really young guy who was the gas station attendant the day I went in. And in those days, remember, they used, to, they used to put the gas in for you? And I remember pulling in, you had to go behind the station in order to get gas. You all remember yeah. that station. And I was really, I was telling all my friends that I was past thinking about sex. I didn't check out guys. I didn't look at anybody's laps. I was not interested in sex anymore. I could go the whole rest of my life. And I made a list of the 20 things I love to do with my students every semester. I did not put making love on the list because I didn't remember it. And I figured, I am now finished with that part of my life. And I went into that gas station, and he checked my oil, and I needed a quart of oil. And he took the, the can of oil, and in those days they had this spigot that you broke through, and it made that sound, and you saw the spigot went like this. And I was not touching anything. I had an instant orgasm <laughs> in my car by myself <laughs> from watching the spigot go in through the gate. That's when I knew you don't really get pissed ever thinking about it. <laughs> so it's not, it's not about age. And it's especially not about age when you know about there were all these senior housing developments that we're all familiar with. And I do remember the really nice one about the man and the woman. They are in this housing development together, and they sit together for all the current events classes and all the different courses that they learn in book groups and everything. They always sit together holding hands, and they eat their meals together. And one night, he says to her, after dinner, would you like to come up to my apartment? And she says, sure, I'd be happy to. And they go up to the apartment, and they shut off all the lights. They shut all the drapes. They both get undressed. They get into bed. And they have the most wild, fabulous, passionate love that anybody could imagine, let alone from 80-year-old people. And afterwards, he looks at her lovingly and he says, that was the most incredible experience I can ever remember. But I wish you had told me you were still a virgin. <laughs> and she looks at him and says, I wish you had told me you could get an erection and I would have taken off my pantyhose. <laughs> She often says the biggest sex organ is between the ears. 
It has nothing to do with genitalia. It's really between the years. Dorothy Parker wrote on the eternal war between the sexes. Love is woman's moon and sun. Man has other forms of fun. With this, the gist and some of it, what earthly good can come of it? <laughs> now, perhaps you know about the grandson who is in the kitchen of his home when Grandpa is sleeping over. And Grandpa sees him taking a purple pill. And he says, what are you taking? He says, oh, Grandpa, this is just a special pill. It helps me keep an erection longer. He says, well, let me have one. <laughs> and the grandson says, Grandpa, you don't need this. And not only that, they're very expensive. He said, how much are they? He said, well, they're $10 a pill. Don't worry about it. You give me one of these pills tomorrow morning when I come down, I will give you the $10. So he reluctantly gives him a pill. The following morning, Grandpa comes down to the kitchen, hands his grandson $110. <laughs> he said, Grandpa, I told you it's only $10. He said, yes, $10 is from me. The 100 is from Grandma. <laughs> Under no circumstances, regardless of what else you plan to do, should you take a sleeping pill and a laxative on the same night. <laughs> now, I'm going to give you just a few more little tidbits that I'm sure you would like to know. Okay? There are different varieties of sex. One is pension sex. Two men were talking, so how's your sex life? Oh, nothing special. I'm having pension sex. Pension sex? Yeah. You know, I get a little each month, but not enough to live on. <laughs> then, of course, there's something called loud sex. My wife went in to see a therapist and said, I've got a big problem, doctor. Every time we're in bed and my husband climaxes, he lets out his ear-splitting yell. My dear, the shrink said, that's completely natural. I don't see what the problem is. Well, the problem is, she complains, it wakes me up. <laughs> And then, of course, there's wedding anniversary sex. A husband and his wife have a bitter quarrel on the day of their 40th wedding anniversary. The husband yells, when you die, I'm getting you a headstone that says, cold as ever. And she says, and I'm getting yours that says, stiff at last. <laughs> Notable quotes from people that you all have heard of. Frank Sinatra said, There are a number of mechanical devices which increase sexual arousal, particularly in women. Chief among these is the Sniper Fire Benz SJL 500. <laughs> George Burns says, It isn't premarital sex if you have no intentions of getting married. <laughs> Jack Nicholson said, my mother never saw the irony in calling me a son of a bitch. <laughs> Barbara Bush, the former US uh, first lady said, Clinton lied. A man might forget where he parks or where he lives, but he never forgets oral sex, no matter how bad it is. <laughs> Robin Williams said, ah yes, divorce from the Latin word meaning to rip out a man's genitals through his wallet. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman said, there's a new medical crisis. Doctors are reporting that many men are having allergic reactions to latex condoms. They say they cause severe swelling. So what's the problem? <laughs> Robin Williams also said, see, the problem is that God gives man a brain and a penis and only enough blood to run one at a time. <laughs> John Rivers said, it's been so long since I've had sex, I've forgotten who ties up who. <laughs> Steve Martin said, sex is one of the most wholesome, beautiful, and natural experiences money can buy. <laughs> Bob Hope said, you don't appreciate a lot of stuff in school until you get older. Little things like being spanked every day by a middle-aged woman. <laughs> stuff you pay good money for later in life. <laughs> Oscar Wilde said, bigamy is having one wife too many. 
Monogamy is the same. <laughs> now check this out. Stay alert. In 40 years, we will have millions of old ladies running around with tattoos and pierced navels. <laughs> the only two things we do with greater frequency in older age is urinate and attend funerals. And I was at the Oakdale Theater when Buddy Hackett appeared last time. And Buddy Hackett told this great story. He said, you know, he gets up in the middle of the night a million times and he has prostate trouble. He said, and if you don't know what prostate problems are, it's when you feel like you have to pee, you feel like you have to pee, you feel like you have to pee, and you go to pee and nothing happens. He said, the other night it was three o'clock in the morning, I'm standing in the bathroom and I'm trying to go, trying to go, nothing's coming out. Finally, I look down and I say to him, you're the one who got me up. <laughs> and Cherie yells from the bedroom, Buddy, who are you talking to? And I said, no one you'd remember. <laughs> Don't let aging get you down. It's too hard to get back up. <laughs> the secret to happiness is a good sense of humor and a bad memory. The way to avoid elderly wrinkles is to go braless. It will usually pull them out. <laughs> When possible, let the valet park your car. Valets don't forget where they park. And consider a nut-free diet. Avoid people who drive you nuts. And I would like to close my talk to you tonight with three paths to a more passionate life. One, sexual revitalization. Do something that either you haven't done before, you haven't done in this way before. If you usually shut the lights out, put them on, it doesn't matter. People, as they get older, their close eyesight is not as good as <laughs> Second, search for a new dream, like taking up singing or a foreign language or some new course. I take new courses every semester because I really want more stuff coming into my head than what's already there. We already know what's already there. And third, spiritual exploration, a desire for the spirit to be set free. If you believe in God, that's great. If you don't believe in God, find something else that you really believe in and that brings you joy to think about it and to act in accordance with it. <coughs> Sex, passion, and soul go together. And it is guaranteed that you will live longer, healthier, and happier lives if you take some of the advice given tonight. Thank you so much for coming. There's nobody in this room, and I don't care how young or old you are, there's no one in this room who has not had loss. If you have not had any losses whatsoever, then you haven't lived. You didn't have any family members, nothing. And there is not a question but that illness is a loss because you're not able to have your normal life. All of us deal with losses. And the question is, do you want to stay stuck in it or do you want to move out of it? And that is really a decision that we make. Every day, we make a decision about how we are going to greet that day. My close friend, whose name is Connie, who's the person who's doing this, this particular um, you know, project, Connie calls me every morning at 6.30. We're both early risers. And by the way, we started this when both of us had husbands who were not well. It wasn't that we were in empty houses. She calls at 6.30 in the morning, I see her name, I say, and I also know the phone is ringing at 6.30, it's got to be Connie, or some nut job. <laughs> I pick up the phone, I say, good morning, sunshine, and she says, good morning, wonderful woman. We talk about the fun we had the day before, what kind of fun things are we going to do this day, and I start my day every day. Now, both of our husbands are gone, and this way we have company, we're not alone in the house totally, because we have a friend who calls us on the telephone. And that is one of the wonderful things about Alexander Graham Bell's invention, right? Whether it was a cell phone or not is not relevant. Connect with somebody. Connection is the most important thing we as human beings have. And that's one of the reasons why very often we're finding, you know, I've been giving a talk called The Joy of Petting. That is really about having a pet. Because, in case you thought it was just a whole thing. <laughs> that I could One, do an two. entire talk about foreplay <laughs> and what I remember. You know. But the fact is, if you are alone and don't have Connie to call at 6.30 in the morning and don't have another friend, 
depending on what time you get up. We all have friends that you know what their schedules are like. One of my friends called me from Florida today, true story. Her name is Selma, she called me today, she said, Joyce, I'm calling you today to let you know that I am now up by eight o'clock in the morning, because I'm gone. But she used to get up at 10, and I'm gone. I can't speak to her in the morning. So now I can call her because she'll go to bed at a normal hour, which I do not. My friends know they can call me up until 11.30 at night. They can call me after 6.30 in the morning. Connie calls at 6.30, my friend Irma calls me at 7, and my friend John, who is here with me tonight, calls usually at 7.30. So I start my day connected to three people I love. And I recommend highly that you find at least one friend or a family member who you can talk to. First thing in the morning, it doesn't have to be 6.30, but if you get up at 10, have somebody who is up at 10 that you can feel connected <coughs> to somebody you care about. It will make all the difference in the world. <laughs> More times, daytimes. Uh, that's what Deb set up. But what I, there is nothing the Cheshire Library can ask me to do that I would not do. That all the money that I have given away, as you know, I teach at Southern. I never could have given away a million dollars because I've never made a million dollars. <laughs> the only way this happened was for speaking for all the insurance companies and all of these different places. And I'm happy to speak for any of you who need a speaker. I'm happy to come. I work with their budget, and they make out the check to one of the charities. So it's all around, it's, it's good both ways. Well, I should tell you, by the way, the Jewish New Year just began this past week, and the fast day is on Wednesday when we can't eat for 26 hours, can't even have water, and you're not allowed to have sex on that day either. And during that time, we, we are kind of introspective. We think of the things we may have done wrong over the last year, and we make a, kind of a not a resolution in the way of a New Year's resolution, but some thought that we're going to do better in the coming year. And it is customary to wish everybody a happy New Year. So I believe you can never have too many celebrations. I celebrate the Chinese New Year. I celebrate the Jewish New Year. I celebrate the regular New Year. So I would like to wish all of you a very happy year. And the Jewish calendar is 5,780. 5,780 is the Jewish New Year. And I hope all of you, I hope you will be back many times and that I will be here many times to come and help you lighten up a little. And I hope you remember to put the jokes near your phone for when your kids and grandkids. Thank you.